at which point we were separated and I was thrown into a Soviet military cell. It was at that point that the, uh, the funny side of what had happened diluted somewhat. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app so that you don't miss a single episode. This is the second part of my interview with Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Harrison, MBE, who served for two years as a full-time touring officer with Bricksmiths. In this episode, we hear of Stephen's imprisonment in a Soviet army jail following a detention in a Soviet garrison town as well as East German and Soviet Army press coverage about his activities. Stephen's speciality was using his language skills to engage and befriend opposition troops and thereby gain valuable intelligence. He used to go into bars frequented by Soviet officers and recalls one particularly drunken night in Potsdam. Stephen also shares details of the top-secret Operation Tomahawk, a particularly unpleasant mission, which may not be for those of a sensitive disposition. In later years, Stephen obtained his Stasi file, which reveals that the surveillance on him was far closer than he'd ever believed. Cold War history is disappearing, but a simple monthly donation will keep this project going and allow me to continue preserving these incredible stories. You'll join our community... Get the sought-after Cold War Conversations drinks coaster as a thank you and bask in the warm glow of knowing that you're helping to preserve Cold War history. Hi, I'm Andrew and I'm very proud to support Cold War Conversations with a small donation each month because Ian's put together such a brilliant range of interviews. If you do support the podcast, your wallet will be a tiny bit lighter but your brain will be very, very thankful. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. I'm delighted to welcome Stephen Harrison to our Cold War conversation. I was only detained uh, once by the NVA, and that was by the um, signals people. We had come across, stumbled across, a signals uh, deployment exercise taking place. We uh, uh, decided to have a um, to have a have a closer look. And the NVA set up a, an am- ambush for us, and they managed to detain us. Uh, and in order to have, in order to escape, uh, we would have had to reverse through through people who were who were blocking the blocking the vehicle. And when I tried to engage them in conversation in my normal style, they they didn't want to know. There was not a single word that was uttered by them. Um, there was just weapons raised, and um, of course. The British liaison mission didn't recognise East German authority. Our our right to be in East Germany was uh, was accorded to us by the Soviets, and therefore, whenever East Germans tried to detain us, whether that was Volkspolizei or NVA, we would protest that this was illegal, that we had the right of freedom of movement uh, under the robertson malinin Agreement, and that how dare they, how dare they restrict this. Uh, and they were to summon immediately the local Soviet uh, commandant, and we were not going to uh, negotiate with them. To give you an idea of the, the lengths that they were prepared to go to. I, I mentioned earlier when we overturned in our vehicle and, and, and hit the deer and all the rest of it. Eventually, an NVA unit turned up and they, and they detained us. And I protested and said that the, they had no right to detain us. I mean, in fact, we weren't going anywhere because my vehicle was upside down. But anyway, they had no right to detain us. And we insisted on the attendance of the local Soviet commandant. Well, what this um, chap did, and I had, spoke, I had spoken to the, um, the, the NVA officer in Russian because I wanted to impress upon him that uh, our right to be there was accorded by the Russians. We did not recognize the NVA. So I only spoke Russian. He handed me a document, because uh, they also spoke Russian, most of the NVA officers spoke Russian. He handed me a document and he asked me to sign it. And uh, I asked him in Russian what it was. And he said, oh, it's uh, it's nothing. It's just uh, what it, what this does is gives me the authority to bring out a, a crane 
Uh, it's called an 8T210. Bring out a crane and put your vehicle back on its wheels again. I can't, we can't deploy these assets without, without a signature. Well, I read the document. It was written in German and it was a full confession to having spied, uh, having been caught spying in East Germany. So I declined um, to sign that. But that was the sort of lengths that they, they would go to. They were much sharper, much, much sharper than the Soviets. You had to be on your guard when dealing with, with the NVA. But, of course, we didn't recognise any East German authorities, which is the same reason why, if they were told to stop by the Volkspolizei, if they deployed their vehicles and stood in the middle of the road and, and put their blue lights on and all the rest of it, we just drove around them and, and waved happily uh, um, uh, uh, and, and ignored them because um, uh, we were there by virtue of the Soviet-British agreement mm nothing to do with the East Germans at all, which really, really bugged them. It really irked them that we were operating like this in their country and, uh, and not obeying their orders, which, of course, uh, for the East German population were were everything. You know, there was a police state. Um, and for someone to wave, wave at a, a police officer as they were trying to detain you and, and just swerve around them... It just would just would never happen. Would never happen in East Germany. I could imagine. I could imagine. So when when you are detained, what is the procedure there? You you wait for the Soviets to or the the local commandant to turn up, and then what what is the routine there that they go through? It depends on the nature of the detention. Some some detentions were quite benign, uh, and in some cases, I would accept a detention when I could have escaped because um, the Soviets were trying to detain us in an area where they, which they thought was restricted, I knew was not restricted. And therefore, by taking a hit, taking a detention, you could then initiate a, a, a protest or a protest would be made at much, much higher levels. Other detentions were much more violent. And uh, there's a history of, of violent detentions of people being dragged from their cars and uh, uh, and cars being uh, ransacked, rammed, uh, fired at. I mean, I mean, s serious, serious road accidents, um, which resulted in detentions. So there was no real template. But once things had calmed down, the, the Soviet commandant uh, was summoned. You remember I mentioned to you earlier the commandatura vehicle. So mm -hmm. someone from the commandant's office would appear and he would appear and he would uh, engage you in, in conversation and ask you uh, what you were doing here and it invariably ask you to sign what he called an act, which was written in Russian, which again uh, invited you to admit to, to having carried out uh, spying activities, all the rest of it. He and only he could demand your Soviet um, ID card from you. If anybody else uh, demanded to see your Soviet ID card, you were not obliged to show it to them. But if the commandant did, you had to give them and he could take them away. In fact, I've got my I've got my ID card here, which, um, which I've, I kept. I About a week before I left Berlin for the final time, I, I conveniently lost my Soviet ID card. And the reason I kept it was only because of, I don't know whether you can see it there, the top uh, top corner, the, the irony yeah. of the the irony of the military number that they gave me. Uh, so Stephen's showing me the, the ID card here and uh, his ID number starts 007. <laughs> <laughs> and we thought that was a real hoot the soviets never really did get it i don't think they had um they had watched any of that nonsense so the the, the commandant would um arrive and uh you would uh, then engage in conversation with him he would invite you to sign an act he would wag his finger at you and escort you out of the area and that's that that's on on the assumption that it'd be, it had been whilst you were engaged in some intelligence gathering activity where we had not been engaged in that, but we decided to take the hit. Then the initiative was with the tour. So I was on a tour once with a fiery Scotsman and we were, it was a long tour. Uh, it was six, six days and five nights. And we carried with us only a certain amount of fresh rations. And on day four or five, I decided we were going to go and buy some bread. So we went into the local garrison town. And this local garrison town on the official Soviet map was not in a restricted area. All the tours had this map with us, which was signed by the 
chief of staff of the group of Soviet forces in Germany. It denoted exactly where the tours could and could not go. Well, this garrison town, which was right next to Letzlinger Heide training area, was in an open area. The problem was the local Soviet garrison didn't know that. They just assumed that any bricksmiths or mission vehicle in their area was immediately to be detained. So this Scotsman and I went in there and we hopped out the vehicle and we went into the bread shop and I was busy ordering my sliced white, whatever. And in came the um, the town patrol consisting of an officer and uh, two soldiers, all armed, and they immediately grabbed us. And you could tell that they were animated and um, they frog marched us out of the shop. I was protesting all the time, but I knew that what they were doing was illegal. I had no idea what they were going to do with us. In the meantime, the driver who was parked outside the shop, he just sort of gingerly started the vehicle and followed us at walking pace. And um, a small crowd gathered and we were frog marched down the... <laughs> down the equivalent of Aldershot High Street and um, and taken into this barracks, at which point we were separated and I was thrown into a cell. I was thrown into a Soviet military cell. And uh, it was at that point that the uh, the funny side of what had happened uh, diluted somewhat. And I became a little bit concerned, not least for the welfare of the driver and uh, the, uh, the tour NCO. But and uh, not to look a gift horse in the mouth, it was possible uh, from where I was to read the notice boards um, outside the cells, giving all the details of the duty officer roster and the name of the unit commander, the the, the number of the unit and all the officers. So I managed to jot all those down. Anyway, we were left there for some time. We were given nothing to eat or or drink and and during this time as i subsequently found out there were phone phone calls being made back to headquarters gsfg in zossen we've captured we've captured the brits we've captured the brits and then someone must have said well actually um they're allowed to be there uh <laughs> and so what happened after several hours was that um a very apologetic commandant came and opened the door of my cell and invited me out and offered me an apology and then invited me back into the commanding officer's office where the commanding officer had to stand up and issue a formal apology for having detained me and manhandled me and the Turencio in this way. Then after that, he broke out the vodka, uh, the broad vodka and the uh, stale bread and uh, blinis and uh, caviar. Over the next couple of hours, we... Um, we put the world to right over 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 a few a few shots of vodka, and then we were released with you know lots of bonhomie and, and waves. But at the, at, until that point, I must admit uh, the prospect of, uh, of of being incarcerated in a Soviet military jail wasn't wasn't amusing. But inevitably, the protests were made, and the Soviets did issue a a formal apology. And uh, I, I showed them the map. Um, I showed them the map we have because I used to carry the map with me. And I said, no, we are in an open area. Are you, I said to the, com the, the commanding officer, are you telling me that you, a lieutenant colonel, know better than three-star General Kalyaznikov, or whatever his name was, who signed this map? And he says we can be here and you say we can't. Now, should we ring him and see who's right? Um, and he just... He, he completely dismissed me. He was absolutely cock a hoop that they had arrested the, the British spies. But later on, he did admit that he hadn't been aware of this, this map that I had shown him, that I that we had been correct, that the detention had been unlawful and uh, and no hard feelings, mate. And that, that, that's how that one ended. Brilliant. Brilliant. Did you have any uh, incidents crossing Glenica Bridge? one of the sentries who operated the gates on Glenica Bridge. Uh, I used to chat chat to these people as they were processing documents, and uh, I asked him for some Soviet military badges, and he said he didn't have any then, but he would have them next time. And um, next time we crossed the Glenica Bridge from... East Germany back into West Berlin, I did give him some East Marks. So not, not West Marks. I did give him some East Marks and he gave me a, a little cellophane bag full of, full of badges. I did so without 
um, the authority to do so. It was a, uh, a a real error of judgment on my part. That was protested by the Soviets. They obviously found out maybe they had cameras. I'm sure they did have cameras. And it was part of a protest that was made against me, um, not just on its own, but as part of a wider protest against my activities in the mission and i've got i've got actually the 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 formal the formal statement here about what they were saying that i was up to um and it resulted in um press coverage about what they thought i was doing in east germany and and my my scurrilous behavior and it and it concentrated on on what i liked to do which was talking to people uh, and they were convinced that i was some sort of professional intelligence gathering agent who was hell bent on turning both civilians and military personnel and bribing them for information and bits and pieces. And so they, they concocted this story and I was in the amusing position of <laughs> being the chief's interpreter when he was summoned to the headquarters of the group of Soviet forces in Germany in Zossen. And he was given a dressing down my my chief of mission was given a dressing down by the colonel general three star general soviet general about me and i was the interpreter so brilliant <laughs> i ended up having to translate uh, all sorts of things about which i was meant to have done and then listen to the chief's explanations of what had happened and what he would do about it it was it was, it was you know, I, I can look back at it now uh, and and smile, but it wasn't amusing at the, uh, at the time. But the the Soviets uh, had got it into their head that I was first of all a, a chemical weapons specialist. Secondly, I was a military military uh, train specialist, and thirdly, that I was engaged in um, trying to turn, bribe, corrupt Soviets uh, during the course of my work and. It is true. I uh, I did go on town tours, uh, which were in uh, dressed in, in in normal British military uniform. We used to go into a garrison town in in an open area, w with the sole intention of uh, of just um, going to places where the Soviet officers went to to socialise. Because Soviet soldiers were never allowed out of barracks. Only Soviet officers were allowed out of barracks ever. And uh, so we would go to their pubs and and just go and go in there and and uh, you know, normally a silence <laughs> came across the bar as, <laughs> as the same it's like going into one of those western saloons yeah, was it? A, bit, <laughs> a bit like that but um it didn't take long for barriers to to break down and and uh, you if, if one of the political officers were there then uh then you wouldn't get any joy at all all the soviet officers would be told to leave us alone not not engage with us but more often than not they weren't there and i remember going there together with a uh, with an officer again who sat who's sadly no longer with us he who's who was in the intelligence corps also a um russian speaker and we were self-driving and we were driving um an opal senator three liter bricksmith vehicle and <laughs> we, we went to this uh garrison town and we got involved with these soviets and we were we were arguing the toss about afghanistan we were comparing pay scales we were talking about uniform about everything and we got absolutely hammered absolutely hammered on on whatever it was they were drinking and it got to sort of chucking out time and um i thought my colleague was going to drive and he thought i was going to drive and we were completely wrecked um so we had to negotiate um the very short trip about uh, two miles to to the mission house uh, in our opal senator when we were certainly not fit not fit to drive so that's an admission I, i've made on on, <laughs> on this podcast um but so, so it, it was inevitable that the the that the soviets um formed the impression that because i was quite gregarious and and just loved chatting and meeting people they thought that i was some steely-eyed tensile steel spring of a of a spy who was whose job it was to turn them um and so they 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 turned on me mm. yeah well that's what your id card said as well <laughs> so you can hardly blame them 
I, th- I think it's really interesting because your, your approach of actually going into the pubs that the Soviet officers were, were drinking in, I've, I've never heard of that. Yeah, they're called town, town tours. Um, we also did cultural tours, but that, that wasn't so much going into pubs where the Soviet officers were. That was taking our families, including children, in a marked VW bus, number 10 it was called, and we would go and and uh, spend um, a couple of days in well, wherever we wanted to in East Germany. So we used to go to Dresden, Leipzig, Rostock, all sorts of places, and we would just go and be there. We'd stay in a hotel, we would eat in the, in, in the restaurants, we would go shopping, and of course the... the uh, uh, the narcs, the the Stasi, used to come out in in, in their droves to uh, follow us, and uh, even um, uh, engaged my daughters in conversation in a shop and asked them what their daddy did and all this sort of stuff. But it, it was it was it was laughable. We always knew when we had um, surveillance, and uh, my wife used to love love it when we had surveillance because um, she used to you know play and 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 hide around corners and stuff like that, which was which was unnecessary. But again. It, it, they were made themselves so obvious that it was it was impossible uh, to ignore them. But on those occasions, we would uh, quite openly walk the streets of Dresden or Leipzig or uh, Karl Markstadt or uh, all, all the major cities in um, in East Germany where we had uh, the right to be, just to exercise that right. Mm-hmm. And we would chat to people, and we would talk to Russians, we'd talk to East Germans, we'd talk to people who were visiting East Germany on business or on holiday just to, to fly the flag. We normally got quite a frosty reception in Dresden, mind, um, particularly when I went down there with a couple of RAF officers. Um, but uh, other than that, generally, people were very amenable. It was, it, was, it was, again, amusing that wherever we went in East Germany, whenever we booked into a hotel, we found out uh, when we compared notes afterwards that where, whenever anybody went to the, for instance, the um, it's called the Hotel Elephant in Dresden. Brixmas families were always given the same rooms, always given mm, the same room. I wonder, I wonder why. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> and were you in in dress uniform for those tours, or yeah. or in your jumpers? No, and... no, we were in dress uniform. In dress uniform. Right. So uh, it would be um, uh, number four dress or number two dress uh, or service service dress for officers. Um, so we're, we're in, in, in full dress uniform, no, no, no combats. We weren't trying to, weren't trying to be soldiers. We, we were soldiers on holiday. We were having our holiday mm-hmm. and, uh, the East Germans thought this a really strange concept that we would, why, why do you want to come here? Why are you here? Um, and we would say, well, it's, it's clearly for the food and the accommodation, must have caused quite a stir, I guess, in some towns. Well, it did. Uh, I, I, um, I remember going with a, a warrant officer, again, another warrant officer in the SAS one evening when we had little little else to do and we decided to go and pay Colditz Castle a visit. And um, this was in 1987. And we drove to Colditz. And the first thing we did was we went to the station, uh, which was, which was um, deserted. And we each had our photos taken underneath the Colditz sign under the station and then we went up into the castle and we drove up into the castle and it was in complete darkness and we parked in the in the courtyard and it was almost like being watching the watching the film series um you know back in the 70s i remember watching cold it's and there's this huge cobbled courtyard and um, we tried various doors and none of the doors uh worked and eventually we went up this flight of stairs and we tried this uh, door and it opened and <laughs> in front of us was a huge dormitory and it was full of men most of them either uh naked or just partially dressed and uh with some attendants who were all dressed in white and some of the attendants came rushing over towards us and there was a huge commotion huge commotion and we were bundled back out of the door and um, 
I saw, and, and, and this chap said, what, what, who the hell are you? What are you doing here? And I explained to him, you know, British mission. And he said, you can't come in here. You cannot come in here. These people, these people are unpredictable. So at that time, it was being used as a, um, uh, an asylum for people with mental health issues. And people who like that in East Germany, uh, they were just locked away. And what better place than in Kolditz? Anyway, we were escorted to the um, the office of the... I don't know what he was called, the commandant, the boss man. And he explained to us what was going on there. And it took us on a small tour and we got very friendly chatting. This was late, late at night. It was a cold, cold night. And I, I said to him, you know, what, what is it that you, you really miss here? And he said, do you know what? None of us, none of us here, patients, staff have had fresh fruit in a long time. Anyway, to cut a long story short, we left, uh, we apologized for having disturbed this, this, we didn't know it was a mental health asylum and we went back to um, West Berlin and we organised a trip down with number 10 and we went to the shops in West Berlin and we bought basket loads of fruits, not just common, commonly available fruit, fruits, you know, bananas and apples and stuff, but we bought loads of things like kiwi fruits and cherries and pineapples and mangoes and all sorts of things and it was a bucket load of stuff and we took it down there and we delivered it and the the the, the chap who's in charge of called it he just burst out crying anyway to cut this to an even shorter story thereafter he invited any of the Bricksmith cultural tours to come along to Colditz and he would give them a tour around the unoccupied parts of the castle. And in exchange, we would always deliver baskets of, of fruit, which um, which were uh, handed out to staff and, and patients alike. I can't remember how we got onto this subject. Um, um, uh, I, I don't care, to be honest. It's a great story. <laughs> it's a great story. Yeah. Um, now, you, you made it into Neues Deutschland, the East German Communist Party paper, and Red Star, the Soviet Army paper as well. Yeah, yes, yes, I did. Um, yes, uh, th- it was basically, it was the incident I was talking about earlier where the Soviets um, raised questions as to uh, what I was really up to in... Um, in East Germany and that I was involved in the uh, recruiting and turning of people. And, and I, I, at the time, and to a certain extent now, I regarded it really as a badge of honor, really that the, 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 um, the Soviets thought that that was happening to me. It says, uh, I've got, I've got the common, I've got the report here. Uh, this was the report written by my boss. It said, um, his uh, linguistic abilities, his skills as a tourer, made him a particular threat to the Soviets. His menace was acknowledged when the Soviets deliberately prefabricated and published a series of allegations against him in the hope of curtailing his activities. So, um, <laughs> in- interesting enough, uh, the uh, other uh, reports that I've read about me were, were generated by the um, secret police, the Stasi. So when the wall came down in 1989... The Stasi tried to uh, destroy uh, as many of the files they had, not just on us, but on on, on East German citizens. Um, And a mechanism, um, they didn't manage to destroy all of them. In fact, I think only about a third they managed to destroy. A mechanism was set up then for people, anybody, to apply to the German government to have their Stasi files. Uh, So I applied, and uh, fortunately, mine were not destroyed, and I received 186 pages of files which the Stasi had generated on me, on my wife, on my children. They knew my address in West Berlin. They knew my telephone number in West Berlin. They knew my car registration number in West Berlin. There was a lot of stuff in in that report which uh, was was laughable. They thought I was doing things which I which I wasn't. They they thought I was much more capable than I really was. So a lot of it I think was made up in order to justify the Stasi in the first place. But there was one particular incident where their uh, their account of what happened was alarmingly accurate. And in fact, in order for them to have reported on what I was doing they would have had to be extremely close to me which again I 
I was very alarmed about because, well, at the time, if you had asked me if I was clean from surveillance, I would have guaranteed you that I was because I had was taking out one of the senior officers in Bricksmith and um, our job when taking out one of the senior officers was to show him a little bit of excitement, but certainly not put him in any danger. And in this report by the Stasi, they port uh, me what I said to the uh, to, to the senior officer, what I was saying to the driver, that, that the driver and I got out and we had a cigarette and I smoked silk cut cigarettes and it was with a green lighter and um, uh, and, and and what we had to eat and, and it was it was incredibly accurate. How they achieved this i don't know but normally the the stasi that we dealt with were alarmingly amateur uh they operated in groups of three young men shades black leather jackets in a larder or a wartburg you could tell them a mile away but uh, on this occasion they clearly had their wherewithal to um to mount a surveillance operation on me in it i was in an observation not really an observation post but I, we were observing rail lines in a place which I had used before, so perhaps that's one giveaway. I'd gone back to a place which I thought was safe because I had used it before, and uh, they recorded the whole thing. So I, I translated my, my Stasi files into English, and uh, you know, in, I, I showed my daughters this, and their eyes just glazed over when they read all this nonsense. But um, it, it showed me that um, the, the, the Stasi didn't have a real feel for the sensitive things that we were up to a lot of it was fabricated uh, apart from this one incident that i, I mentioned so they, they didn't know of any of this sense they didn't know about the, the rubbish dump operations they didn't know about any of the other bits and pieces that we got up to at night at least it wasn't reported upon i've still got the the, the, the stasi files here so those are the really the only two occasions when i was reported upon neues deutschland which was the east german newspaper and um Krasnazizda, the red star soviet military paper and my um stasi files um with with multiple multiple reports in the files of the mission house staff in potsdam interviewing my daughters who were gosh what were they six and four at the time are trying to get information from from my daughters and um having microphones in the bedrooms and all sorts of things so it was and how, how did your daughters react to that when they read that in a in a file? They had no, they... They have, they have absolutely no idea. And in fact, uh, uh, much later on in another existence, I, I was working in Russia um, in the early nineties, and um, our flat was was bugged. the The lady who came to clean for us, uh, she wasn't what she said she was. The late, uh, even our our driver he was working for somebody else uh, uh the girl's riding instructor uh, whom they loved dearly um turns out that she wasn't who she said she was uh, 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 but we by that stage you know i'd been a, i'd been in this game for the, by that stage for about 8 9 years now uh, in the early 90s and operating in russia you just assumed that um you were under surveillance and you assumed a much higher level of skill in the operatives who who were trying to um, monitor your movements and conversations. But when I showed my daughters um, evidence that they had been cross examined, they, you know, they, in their naivety, they just they just couldn't believe that. Oh, how could the lovely sweet? Oh, but she was so nice, and she used to give us sweeties, and she used to take us riding, and and oh, she was, you know, um, but they were only young. At the yeah, time. they're only young. Yeah, yeah. When you were detained, did you have any sort of like stock excuses you would use to try and, you know, get out of detention? <laughs> yeah, when we did our training in Ashford, the people who were training us uh, were old sweats of the mission. And um, the, we used to practice being detained, as it were. Um, and and, and the, the most commonly used uh, excuse was that you were bird watching. <laughs> <laughs> well a bit like in the uh the great escape when they're uh yeah. um, doing the uh documents in there well it was the only way in which we could explain having a 1000 millimeter glass lens on an, on a, on <laughs> on two nikon f3 drives and binoculars and night vision goggles and yeah. a modulux uh night camera amongst other things 
But uh, no, it really didn't matter what excuse you gave because everybody was playing the same game. Everybody knew the reality. And in fact, uh, when I ended up in Russia, I came across people I had met uh, in the mission and uh, they were going by a different name then. But, but we used to have a laugh about about these sort of things. So I, I would say that I was lost uh, when I got detained. I would say, uh, which was not probably not too far from the truth. Uh, I was uh, uh, bird watching. I was uh, um, testing out the vehicle's cross country capability. Uh, I was <laughs> a, um, uh, I liked to collect number plate records. And of course um, I, I say I, I'm a collector of um, Soviet uh, memorabilia, military memorabilia, which was entirely true. And invariably I could, I could prove that. Um, so, but, but you, you did, you made these excuses with your, with your tongue in your cheek and knowing that um, they knew full well what, uh, what you were doing because they were doing it themselves in West Germany, uh, Soxmas operating, although they didn't have to work in the same way as we did. Uh, we provided so much um, information free of charge uh, in West Germany. You only had to listen to BFBS radio or subscribe to regimental magazines, watch BFBS TV, and you, you didn't have to do anything. You didn't have to get yourself dirty and go onto training areas to find out who was stationed where, who, who the people were. Whereas all of this stuff we had to fight for. We had to fight for this information. When I say fight, I mean we, we had to go and collect it. It wasn't being offered to us on a plate. When we were chatting before we came on air, you you talked to me about sometimes the Soviets would set up sort of like demonstrations for you. Yes. More often than not, we had to work really hard to discover the whereabouts of a particular bit of equipment. And we had to use stealth and subterfuge sometimes and put ourselves at some risk in order to gain uh, photographic coverage of a particular item of equipment and the reaction of the Soviets when they when they saw us was 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 commensurate with them not wishing us to have seen it. In stark contrast, there were occasions when things were uh, ridiculously easy for us, and I remember one occasion uh, I was not involved uh, in this uh, when. It was during the time when Pershing II and intermediate nuclear forces were being uh, discussed and a tour went out onto the Haufeld training area and came across, right out in the open, an SS-23, a, a nuclear-capable intermediate nuclear force, which, which, which were just sat there. And we, uh, and we believe that uh, that and other items uh, sometimes were placed out for us to find in order th uh, that the West could be sure that the most modern and sophisticated military equipment was being deployed onto what they considered their front line. There seemed to be no pattern to it. So we had to, we fought for six months to uh, get hold of images of a particular uh, bit of equipment called 2S6. Uh, we mounted multiple operations to recover uh, a reactive armor box from a Soviet tank. We on only got fleeting images of uh, MiG-29 and Su-27. And then the next day, you would find the new variant of um, self-propelled artillery parked out there in the open. Or in, in one occasion, uh, a, a crew went out onto the tank ranges and came, came across towed artillery, the new, I think it was 2A65, brand new, brand new 152 millimeter towed artillery, left out in the open, in the middle of the ranges. We concluded that the, these were demonstration events. And uh, the same happened to the um, the team who flew the chipmunk over East, East Berlin. You probably know that op Operation Oberon, where Bricksmiths used to man the aircraft that used to fly over uh, within 20, I think, uh, nautical miles of uh, the centre of Berlin, which which took them over Soviet garrisons. On occasions, they used to find stuff which had been deliberately left out in the open, as opposed to what normally happened when the when the chipmunk got airborne. Um, stuff would be shoved back in their hangars out of sight. 
but on occasions they would they would go across the Dalgar Dobritz training area or or the Potsdam Garrison thirty five motor rifle division and and just find stuff being left for them to um photograph to their heart's content. I get the SS-23 because there were those arms control negotiations going on and so therefore they perhaps just wanted to say, look, this this is here. But the other stuff, are they trying to just say, look, we've got some really good kit here? Or I d- I'm, I'm trying to understand their reasoning. Yeah, well, I'm, I, I don't think I can really help you there, Ian, because I, I, we, we didn't really understand it uh, as well. What was really difficult to find on one day was suddenly presented to us on another Yes, a uh, bit of a mystery, that. Um, can you tell me about Operation Tomahawk? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, Operation Tomahawk um, was an operation which was really um, what the people in London called the goose that laid the golden egg. They often said the results of would justify the existence of the mission on their own, without any of the other stuff that we provided. Operation Tomahawk was so valuable. And Operation Tomahawk uh, involved exploiting Soviet and uh, East German military rubbish tips. And the reason we exploited them was because the Soviets and the East Germans had no form of uh, disposal of classified documents. They used to crunch them up and throw them in the waste paper. And that waste paper was then added to all of the other rubbish from a unit, uh, including from the medical station. So bandages and syringes, including from the kitchens. So rotting food. And it was all bundled into a um, into a Soviet military lorry. We used to call them GGG, Gash Garrison Garbage. Uh, And this would drive out to the local rubbish tip. And it would tip and we would be tasked to go to rubbish tips either as a planned operation. Uh, so in, in advance of West Berlin, we were told that we were to go and visit this particular tip on this particular night. Or if we came across a gash garrison garbage vehicle leaving a Soviet barracks, we would follow it and we would stand off and watch and look exactly where it tipped its load. And then we would disappear And we'd come back normally in between the hours of two and four in the morning. And we'd park the vehicle up somewhere off, somewhere um, away from the site so as not to leave any tire marks. We would uh, dress in um, uh, specialist rubber over boots. We would wear protective uh, gloves and clothing. And we would carry with us uh, East German potato sacks um, so that if we had to dump the sacks in a hurry it couldn't be attributed as to anything from the west and we would go two of us the tour officer and the tour nco would disappear off and one would rummage uh, in amongst the rubbish whilst the other kept a lookout with night vision goggles normally it was the russian speaker who would go through the paperwork but actually we didn't really read what we were picking up we used to shovel everything into these um, east german potato sacks any paperwork at all whether it was handwritten or whether it was uh, printed uh, printed matter would all get shoveled into the bag and the place used to st- uh, used to stink there were rats running everywhere there were stray dogs and quite often the soviets would not use a rubbish tip itself they would just drive out of their barracks onto a bit of wasteland near their barracks wall and just tip it and drive off again so quite often this this would be happening right under the noses of the uh, the soviet barracks so you had to keep an eye out and then you would uh, take these these sacks full of material back to your vehicle uh, you would tape them up and double bag them because it stank and then take it back to um West Berlin, where we had a team of specialists, the Tomahawk team, whose job it was to sift through bags and bags and bags of Soviet military rubbish. Um, Clearly, paper has its shelf life, so you really had to get on site that night or perhaps the night afterwards in order for, you know, if it rained or something, all this stuff could deteriorate. But it really was one of the most unpleasant tasks we did, particularly when, as we often had occasion to do, you had to go and visit 
the rubbish tips used by the military hospitals. At that stage, we were very interested, or London was very interested in casualties coming back from Afghanistan, which were being treated in East Germany. And a lot of the paperwork that they threw away was about numbers, injuries, treatment received. But, you know, you were dealing with medical wastes, uh, including human waste, including human limbs. It was it was awful. It was awful. And it was usually usually did it on the last night of the tour so that you didn't have to spend too long in the vehicle with this bag of or, or bags of, of, of stuff. And you could get it back to Berlin safely and hand it over. And it would all be tipped out on this huge table. And um, people used to sort through it. And you would be absolutely astonished at what the Soviets used to throw away. Their uh, classified material, technical manuals, maps... And we used to collect this stuff, uh, not just from tips, but also from deployment areas. So if we if we discovered the Soviets were deployed in a particular area of a training area, we used to wait until they had gone and then go in and look around at what they had left. Because the Soviets uh, didn't issue their troops with uh, loo paper. So when, when the um, soldiers needed to go to the loo, they used to pick up any bit of paper that they could and disappear off into the bushes and do their business. So we used to go and uh, find their business and find what they had wiped their bottoms on and put it in bags and take it back with us. And it, it, it was doing things like that, which alerted us to all sorts of things. So people used to use private letters, which they had received from home. On that letter was was a unit address number. So we used to, they're called FPNs. We used to get field postal numbers. We used to get letters from parents expressing hopes and worries about what was going on back at home. We used to find people used to wipe their bums on maps, on the technical manuals. We found organisation charts uh, for units, what they were equipped with, how many people, uh, where they were going. Um, it was the first reference we got to a piece of equipment called 2S6. That was recovered on, on, a, on a piece of paper, which was recovered from these ad hoc latrines. So um, it was a very fruitful but smelly and horrid thing to have to do. And um, the, no matter how many gloves you wore or or, or boots, socks, the, the stench stayed, uh, stayed with you. But, you know, Operation Tomahawk provided just an endless amount of, of both low-level and uh, operational-level um, intelligence as a result of um, them not issuing their troops with loo paper and not having a shredder in the office. That Tomahawk team must have had strong stomachs when they had to uh, go through that stuff. Yeah, but they they loved it, you know. They because they were there wasn't there wasn't a day that went past when they hadn't come across some golden nugget, you know. And uh, yeah, them's the breaks. Yeah, incredible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, um, Stephen, you've been so generous with your time with me but is there anything else bricksmith wise i don't think so i think um the, the intelligence gathering has been covered in by many other people and multiple books have been written about who we were and what we got up to i i, I just wanted to bring rather than concentrate on what everybody knows about bricksmiths is what people perhaps didn't realize which is the human side of the interaction that we had with with people People who were doing a job like uh, like us, who had the same fears, aspirations, hopes as us, and it was just that we happened to be born in different places that we were doing these particular jobs. But I regarded it as the most rewarding and the most exciting time um, that I have had uh, in uniform, work, working in three-man teams where the rank gradient was blurred there was total interdependence and reliance on people who were at the top of their game the the tour ncos incredibly professional capable brave people and most of all the drivers i wouldn't be here if it hadn't been for the drivers who um 
who were just an, a, a, an extraordinary breed of uh, of people as well as being um bloody good drivers so i just wanted to bring that human side you know what, what it was like to tour in a vehicle for mm. six days and five nights and go and collect soviet loo paper or the equipment thereof and um and then give give a east german policeman a bollocking and end up in a soviet jail and 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 res- and have someone's iron cross which hangs on my wall right here and i'm looking at it now uh, that was the human side of what we did there are photos and videos illustrating this episode in our episode notes look for the link in the podcast information Now, this podcast would not exist without our financial supporters, and I want to thank one and all of them for their generous support. If you want to help us, just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate for more information. And you can also join our Facebook group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War conversation. Thanks very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye.